Good evening. This is Dr. Kausik with Chesapeake Urology. I want to thank all of you for joining me on this webinar and Zoom call to talk about enlarged prostate and some of the newer cutting-edge therapies that we have to offer at Chesapeake Urology. First, I'd like to start by saying that this has been a very difficult time, I know, for all of uh, the patients and for even the physicians at Chesapeake. We thank all of you for your uh, ongoing patience as we navigate through, through these troubling times, uh, especially with use of telehealth and some of the newer technologies that we have to offer at Chesapeake. We believe we're still reaching out to most of you and uh, keeping you abridged of uh, all the available treatments. And we encourage all of you to continue to reach out to us through some of these modalities that we have. So with that said, I'd like to start talking about uh, our topic for this evening, which is uh, BPH or the enlarged prostate. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the symptoms related to it, the diagnosis, as well as the treatments. So uh, the agenda for this evening is the importance of your prostate, what is benign prostatic hyperplasia, or as it's commonly referred to as BPH, how is it diagnosed, what are my treatment options once I am diagnosed, and specifically we're going to spend some time talking about one of the revolutionary newer therapies that we have to offer at Chesapeake Urology, which is the Urolift system treatment. So first off, and this is a question that we get asked a lot, what is the purpose of the prostate? Where is the prostate? And why does it give men so much trouble as they get older? So the prostate is a walnut-sized gland at the base of the bladder. Uh, it surrounds the urethra, and the, the physiological purpose of the prostate is essentially to pr produce fluid that transports sperm during ejaculation. So the primary uh, purpose of the prostate is that fertility-based. And in a normal sized prostate, what happens is that despite uh, the, the flow of the urine is unimpeded because the urethra has an open channel uh, as someone voids. Now, as men get older, and there are two phases of prostate growth, the first uh, is during the teenage years when testosterone first rises, and then it continues to grow towards middle age. And then as the prostate grows, what ends up happening is that the channel starts to get restricted because the prostate surrounding the channel starts to constrict the channel, causing uh, troubles with urination. So there are three predominant conditions that we talk about with uh, prostate conditions as men uh, encounter. One is prostatitis, which is inflammation or infection of the prostate, uh, which sometimes can occur where the prostate gets inflamed or irritated, and that's usually treated with antibiotics. And then there's prostate cancer, which is a common cancer among older men. It's typically a slow-growing uh, malignancy. And then there's enlarged prostate, which is the topic of discussion for this evening. Each condition affects the prostate differently. And having one doesn't put you at risk for having another, nor does it mean that you can't have uh, another condition. So there are men who have concurrent issues with uh, enlarged prostate and prostate cancer, for example, or have an enlarged prostate and have uh, an infection of the prostate or prostatitis. So the key part of the prostate getting uh, enlarged is aging. So we do know that as men get older, the prostate starts to get enlarged. It typically affects about 40 million men each year in the United States. By age 60, about 70% of men have an enlarged prostate, and it affects nearly 90% of men by age 80. Now, having an enlarged prostate doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have bothersome urinary symptoms, but it does put you at risk for having those uh, troubles with urinary symptoms. So as you see, uh, it's quite clear that with age, the prostate does enlarge and put you more at risk for having troubles with urination. So benign prostatic hyperplasia, or it's, as it's commonly referred to as BPH, is the non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate gland. It is not an indication or a predictor for cancer, uh, and it essentially what happens as, as we talked about earlier with the change in hormones as men get older, the prostate gland starts to enlarge. By enlarging, it starts to constrict on the urethra, which then causes the troubles with urination. Uh, PSA, which is a commonly uh, used test that we for screening for prostate cancer, can rise with both an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer. So PSA alone cannot tell you what the condition is. Oftentimes, we do use PSA to further evaluate men uh, and to rule out other conditions like prostate cancer. So as I was mentioning earlier, as the prostate enlarges, pressure can be put on the urethra. This then causes troubles with urination. Uh, and one 
uh, something that surprises a lot of our patients is that it doesn't always correlate directly to the size of the prostate. And what I mean by that is you can have men with a smaller prostate causing significant troubles with urination. And surprisingly, there are men with large prostates uh, as they get older who have very minimal symptoms with uh, troubles with urination. So size alone doesn't tell the entire story. Uh, but size is a predictor in terms of troubles with urination. So uh, as you see in this slide here, uh, with a normal anatomy, where there, there, there's a wide open channel, which is unobstructed. And on the right-hand side there, uh, there, the prostate starting to enlarge, which then squeezes off the channel, similar to a straw getting pinched off, which then causes uh, troubles with urination. So one question I commonly get asked is, if my prostate is enlarged, does it need to be treated? And the answer is yes, usually it does. Uh, but in some men, it may not need to. And it depends on a variety of factors. Uh, it depends on your tr the troubles that you're having with urination, how well you're emptying the bladder, uh, whether the symptoms that you're having are affecting your quality of life. But we do recognize that an enlarged prostate that causes obstruction of the channel can lead to troubles with, the, uh, with bladder health. Uh, and an analogy I oftentimes use in my practice is that of high blood pressure and uh, heart issues. If you have uncorrected high blood pressure, that can cause damage, silent damage to the heart. So similarly here, if you have an enlarged prostate that constricts or affects the flow of urine, that subsequently can cause some problems with the bladder down the road. Not treating an enlarged prostate in some men can lead to long-term permanent bladder damage. Not for everybody, but it certainly puts you at risk. So again, this is a, a schematic of how uh, the prostate enlarges. Uh, you can see the white part in the middle there is the, the enlarging gland, which is slowly compressing the, the urethra or the channel that you urinate through. And below those views are the what we call cystoscopic views, which is the view that we get when we take a look in with the camera, which is the predominant test that we use oftentimes to diagnose this. Uh, and it you can see on the far left channel, uh, the, 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 the far left picture rather, the, the channel is open and as the prostate starts to enlarge, that progressively restricts the channel, uh, creating more problems for the bladder and causing changing in your, changes in the urination. So what are the symptoms that should alert you that you may have an enlarged prostate? Uh, the most common symptoms are frequent urination, multiple trips to the bathroom, a sudden urge to urinate, which is difficult to postpone and can lead to leakage or incontinence, difficult or painful urination, weak stream, incomplete emptying, uh, and starting and starting of uh, starting and stopping of flow, and also getting up at night multiple times. So those are the typical symptoms that we see uh, that suggest to us that a man presenting with those symptoms would have an enlarged prostate. And as we talked about, predominantly this affects quality of life. So an enlarged prostate in some men rarely can cause long-term bladder damage and it can cause issues with uh, bleeding or infections. But the predominant issue that bothers, uh, that men suffer with, with an enlarged prostate is a change in their quality of life. And many men who suffer from BPH experience a reduction in their quality of life because of the frequency and the urgency, they avoid travel. It interrupts their leisure activities. So oftentimes I hear men telling me that, you know, they can't sit through a movie. They have to get up and oftentimes go in the, in the middle of the of movie. Uh, it results in them using the bathroom stalls multiple uh, instead of the urinals because they have dribbling or it takes a lot longer for them to empty. So they feel embarrassed, uh, you know, standing in the, in the stall. And most importantly, it disrupts their sleep patterns, not just for the patient oftentimes, but also for their partner. So that overall affects both the patient and the partner's quality of life. How is this condition diagnosed? So typically when you have symptoms that suggest this, when, and when you make an appointment with one of the physicians at Chesapeake Urology, we'll conduct a, a complete medical history. We'll have you fill out a symptom score profile, which is called the International Prostate Symptom Score, which tells us and puts a numerical value on your symptoms and allows us to further de determine further evaluation. 
a physical exam is performed. We oftentimes will do an ultrasound at the first visit to measure the size of the prostate, see how well you empty your bladder. We'll, do a, we'll check the urinalysis to make sure that there's no blood or signs of an infection. A prostate exam is typically done, which is a digital rectal exam. Oftentimes a PSA will be drawn. And then, as I said, we will sort of get back to how much of this is a bother to you. Because if you have symptoms that are mild and they're not bothersome, they may not require therapy. Uh, and by, by the flip equation, as I said earlier, just because you have an enlarged prostate doesn't necessarily mean that you'll need to have treatment. So it's a discussion about all of these issues, how it impacts your quality of life, and it also depends on some of the findings that we see at the time of the office visit, such as how well are you emptying your bladder and is it causing some changes or damage to your bladder wall. So uh, after the first set of tests that are done uh, and we decide that these are symptoms that are bothersome to you, to further evaluate the condition and determine the optimal therapy, we will typically proceed with additional tests. And commonly at Chesapeake Urology, we will use the cystoscopy, which is a camera test to determine the, size, the length of the prostate, the shape of the prostate, which is critical, and also the health of the bladder. This test has changed significantly over the years. And while men in the past oftentimes would avoid having this test because of fears of what this would entail, it is a simple office space test now. It is done as a local, which means that there's no prep involved. Uh, you come in, numbing gel is used, and a very small camera with a light is then passed in through the urethra channel so we can examine the prostate on the inside as well as the bladder. Typically, the test takes about a minute or two and is carried out with minimal risk. Besides that test, we also, as I said, will use an ultrasound. We will use Euroflow or flow-based test to determine the pressure of the bladder and also look at the flow rate. And once we do all of those tests, typically the, the urologist will sit down with you and oftentimes you can actually see the test on the screen. You can see the cystoscopy on the screen and uh, you will get an, an understanding of your anatomy. And once we do all of those tests, we'll sit down and have a discussion with you as to how best to proceed with therapeutic options. So as I mentioned before, one of the key tests, one of the key parts of the history is the International Prostate Symptom Score or the IPSS. Uh, it is basically a symptom gauge based on multiple different variables and those are scored from a, a one to five. Uh, and then those, those numbers are totaled to give you a total score. And uh, the, the IPSS is scored from zero to seven is a mild score from an eight to a 19 is moderate, and 20 to 35 is severe. Uh, and then uh, the final and the most important question at the bottom of the IPS is, is how much of this is a bother to your quality of life? Uh, and it's not surprising for us to have sometimes men who have mild symptoms, but it affects their quality of life significantly, and vice versa, some, some men are able to live with moderate to severe symptoms and it doesn't affect their quality of life. So the key component again, as I alluded to before, is how much of this is impacting your quality of life. So once we do all of these tests, we then move on to the treatment options. Uh, and the really great thing about technology as we move forward is that it allows us to move on to more and more cutting edge therapies and things continue to change and grow in this field as with all other fields in medicine. And that allows us to treat men with less side effects, with better results and better improvement on their quality of life compared to what we had to offer 10, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, so as we look at these different treatment options, some of them were not even available 10 years ago. So watchful waiting is one of the options that we can consider. So again, that's appropriate in men who have mild symptoms where it's not bothersome to their quality of life and in men where the initial set of tests suggests no significant risk. So what I mean by that is sometimes men will come in and say, these symptoms are not bothersome to me or I'm doing okay. But then when we do the tests in the office, such as the ultrasound, we find that their prostate is very enlarged. It's significantly blocking the bladder. The bladder is not emptying well. And even though they may feel the symptoms are mild, uh, we would suggest to that person that based on what the tests that we're doing, that they're at risk for progression of this condition. So it's not just based on the, the, the quality of life or the symptom score. So watchful waiting is appropriate for men who have mild symptoms and for men who have tests that show no significant blockage. 
The second option is medications or, or herbal remedies. I'm not a big fan of the herbal remedies. I know that there's a whole slew of market uh, uh, you know, tests of drugs available over the counter. Um, and if you turn on your Sunday talk show, you'll uh, see a lot of claims about different therapies out there. And every time there's a new prostate medication that's been touted as the next best thing. The issue with most of these herbal remedies is that number one, they're not FDA approved. And number two, many of them have not really been through any clinical studies. So if you have an absence of clinical studies, you cannot definitively say something is going to be effective. So although herbal remedies are oftentimes used by men and some men will swear to how well it works for them, as a professional and as a physician, I am somewhat reluctant to recommend herbal remedies to my patients. Uh, medications, however, have been proven, uh, and there are two classes of medications which we'll talk about uh, as we uh, cover this, but both of those are FDA approved and are effective. Uh, the problem with medication is that they are lifelong medications, which means that when you take them and you see an improvement with your symptom score or your quality of life, you will need to continue with the medication essentially for the rest of your life for you to have continued improvement in your symptoms. If you stop the medication down the road, the symptoms will just come back. Uh, so many patients are frustrated by the need to take ongoing medications. Uh, and again, I tell people if it was a medicine that you could take for a short period of time and it fixed the problem, that would be simple. But unfortunately, with an enlarged prostate at this time, we don't have anything like that. And then there's the Urolift therapy, which I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about this evening, which is a revolutionary new therapy where tiny permanent implants are used to open up the passageway to help men with urinating better. This is a more permanent fix for the enlarged prostate and their symptoms. Uh, there are thermal therapies which involve using heat or steam to shrink the prostate. And then finally, there is laser surgery or the TERP surgery and then even laparoscopic options for men with very enlarged prostates. The, the right option for you is based on the discussion that you have with, with your urologist. And different treatments are appropriate for different patients and their different treatments are appropriate in different scenarios. So there is no one size fit all. Uh, and it depends a little bit on the shape of the prostate, the size of the prostate, as I mentioned before, how bothersome the symptoms are to you, and what your goals are of therapy, which we'll talk about as well. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of some of these treatments? Watchful waiting, as I mentioned about, uh, mentioned, is essentially means that you will be seeing the urologist on a, you know, in a frequent manner every six months or a year, but for the time being, you're not going to start on any treatment for your enlarged prostate. The advantage, of course, is it doesn't entail any medication or surgery. <clears throat> there are no side effects because you're really not doing, a, you're not having a therapy. But it also means that you have to live with your condition the way it is. It does oftentimes require lifestyle changes. So many patients who are on watchful waiting will have to avoid certain foods and drinks that may tend to irritate their bladder. Uh, it may cause progressive symptoms uh, because you're not treating the condition. And of course, your quality of life is not gonna improve because you're really not treating the condition. And as I said earlier, this is an appropriate option for men who have mild symptoms uh, and mild symptoms that don't need to be addressed at the time. So as we talked about earlier, I'm gonna spend some time talking about the medications. Uh, commonly used medications are medications like Flomax, Avidart, uh, Cialis, uh, and these are the advantages of medication, again, doesn't involve surgery, it does provide some symptom relief, but as I alluded to earlier, it has to be taken every day, and all medications come with some side effects, and particularly the commonly used medications, which are Flomax, or Uroxetrol, or Rapaflow, can affect sexual performance, sexual drive, uh, potentially affect ejaculation, and they do cause some dizziness and lack of energy as well. Medications, because they have to be continuously taken, often involve uh, out-of-pocket expense. And uh, the more medications people take, the more interactions that medication uh, tend to have. So we know that although some of these medicines may be tolerated well, for a lot of men, they're already taking blood pressure medicines, cholesterol medicines, diabetes medicines. And the more pills that we take and put together, the more the risk of polypharmacy is. Herbal remedies, as I mentioned before, I'm not a big fan of these. They, they you know, in my, in my viewpoint, they may, in some men, they may provide some relief, 
but I don't know enough. I can't definitively say that there's good enough evidence to suggest or recommend this uh, for long-term use. So that brings us to the Urolift system, which is, a, as I mentioned, a revolutionary FDA-approved therapy, which was approved in 2013 in the United States. So it's been around for about six, seven years now. Uh, and this changed really the way we address and treat men with enlarged prostate uh, with, at Chesapeake Urology. Uh, and the key takeaway points from this, uh, unlike the more traditional surgical procedures that we have, are this, this can be done in an office setting. It can be done under a local anesthesia, which means that it doesn't involve you having to be put to sleep, uh, and it doesn't involve uh, you know, a lengthy recovery. Uh, it, is, it preserves your sexual function completely. As a matter of fact, I would say this procedure has fewer sexual side effects than medical therapy does. It allows you to have rapid symptom relief and recovery, and oftentimes men will get back to normal activity within a week. Uh, there's typically no catheter after the procedure, so one of the uh, the big reluctance for men to have traditional surgical therapies for the enlarged prostate is the need for anesthesia, the need for hospitalization, the need for catheter, uh, catheterization afterwards. This allows men to have a, uh, a definitive therapy without those uh, ongoing risks or uh, issues with recovery, and it produces, provides durable results. As with as with any procedure, it comes with some risks. So if you're having a procedure under a local, it does mean that you may have some discomfort during the procedure and for a short period of time afterwards. Most men tolerate the procedure very well in, under a local. Uh, there, is, there will be some blood in the urine, some burning and some mild discomfort, which will typically last anywhere from a few days to about a week or two. But most symptoms will resolve, most side effect symptoms will resolve within two to four weeks after the procedure. And then you will have years of improvement in terms of your symptoms to look forward to. The other therapies, as I mentioned before, after the Urolift are the heat-based or steam-based therapies. Uh, again, some of the advantages, these can also be done in the office. They also tend to have fewer permanent side effects than surgery. Uh, it does require typically a catheter after the procedure. Oftentimes that needs to stay in for several days to sometimes up to a week or two. It does take a longer period of time for healing. So anytime you heat the prostate or you use any form of heat modality, that causes some swelling of the prostate. And when you have swelling of the prostate, it takes longer for you to get better. Uh, and there is still some potential for sexual dysfunction with the heat therapies. Urolift is the only FDA therapy for an enlarged prostate that has no sexual side effects at all. It doesn't affect uh, a man's quality of erection. It does not have any effect on his ejaculation. That's the only treatment, including medications, that can, that can state that. And then finally, there is the traditional surgery that men have heard about, which is the, you know, the TERP or uh, colloquially called the rotor-rooter procedure. That's done in the hospital. Uh, oftentimes, it, it can be done in the surgery center under some settings. But it is a more traditional procedure where uh, the, the, the tissue is shaved or removed, in, uh, the, ch the prostate tissue is shaved or removed, uh, and it does provide significant durable symptom relief, but it does require a fairly lengthy recovery. As I said, oftentimes requires a general anesthesia or a regional, which means a spinal anesthesia. In some men can require hospitalization, uh, it does require a catheter, and key part is the recovery is longer because when you're removing, when you remove tissue, it takes longer for people to recover because that takes longer to heal. If you go out and do strenuous activity within a week or two of having uh, a major procedure like the laser or the TERP procedure, you are more at risk for having complications as a result of that. Uh, all surgeries where you're removing tissue or you're heating tissue can cause some sexual side effects. Uh, the key takeaway with the, the traditional surgery is that it does affect uh, ejaculation and men will typically lose uh, the flow of uh, semen and it can, uh, that can have some negative uh, effects on their sexual function. Uh, there are, as with any traditional surgery, there are some long-term risks like scar tissue, incontinence, uh, and uh, like I mentioned, the sexual side effects. So this is, uh, although been around the longest, does carry the most significant risk profile of the different treatments that we have available. So as I mentioned at the outset, 
you know, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Eurolift system. Uh, this is a revolutionary therapy. It's offered at Chesapeake Urology. As a matter of fact, uh, as a practice, we've done over 6,000 treatments in the last uh, several years. Um, many of our physicians are highly trained in this, uh, and many of them have achieved uh, a distinction called a center of excellence for this uh, procedure, where they have, uh, they have demonstrated a signif significant commitment to expertise with this treatment, it, both an evaluating men and providing them with a significant improvement in their quality of life. The reason that this is revolutionary is unlike the traditional procedures which use heat or which, which rely on scraping the tissue, this involves placing permanent implants that spreads open the passageway of the prostate, providing almost a, uh, an immediate improvement in the symptoms and a very rapid recovery uh, compared to more traditional surgeries with preservation completely of sexual function. So how does the system work? So as we talked about earlier, you know, when the prostate enlarges, it starts to narrow out the channel that you urinate through. So the way this procedure works is a, a, the delivery system or the camera is placed in the channel and in the at the level of the blockage, these small Eurolift implants are placed that essentially lift and push away the prostate tissue and allow it to stay in an open configuration to relieve the obstruction on the bladder. So as you can see from these uh, uh, you know, figures in the bottom, the Eurolift system is uh, placed uh, to access the urethra. It's done through the urethra to access the enlarged prostate. These implants are placed to lift and spread open the passageway. And then that, the system is then removed, leaving the implants in place, which are permanent, that result in an open channel that allows you to have a, a significant improvement in the flow and relief of the obstruction. So oftentimes patients have a concern about having an implant. You know, what does that mean? How is that going, you know, is there going to be any kind of uh, concern related to that? First off, these are very, very small implants. So as you can see with the dive on the side, this is a very small implant. It, con it consists of stainless steel and titanium with a permanent suture in between. Uh, and there is the capsular tab, which goes on the outside of the prostate where it gets anchored and then the suture which then cinches open the passageway. And a good analogy to this, as I tell men, as I look at this diagram, is that consider this like curtain holders holding the side of the curtain open in terms of how this sort of translates to opening up uh, and keeping the prostate open. So here is an animation which uh, we're gonna actually play and uh, sort of show you how this works. Oh, let me see if there's a, which button was it? Enter. Give me a second, and I apologize here. Let me see if I can get this. There we go. So again, this is an animation, a video that shows you how that implant is placed. Uh, the device is placed in. Uh, the urologist finds the right location for it and deploys that implant, which then goes across the prostate. Uh, the, the capsular end tab goes on the outside of the prostate where it anchors to the, the capsule of the prostate, which is fibrous and holds it in place. The suture then allows it to provide tension. And as you can see from this animation, the before and after view, you have a significant mechanical opening of the passageway that provides a more immediate response and relief compared to the more traditional procedures. So again, this is a cystoscopic view of how things look. Before the treatment on your left side, there's the obstructed channel. After the treatment, an open channel. And an immediate improvement in the channel results in a, in a rapid improvement in your symptom score. And because we're doing accomplishing this without cutting or heating the prostate, this allows the recovery to be much quicker. So all procedures, we hope to see an open channel. So this, the open channel is not unique to the Eurolift procedure. Uh, we see an open channel after we do uh, the traditional surgery, surgical procedures like the TERP. The difference is this is accomplished by placing small implants in and it's accomplished mechanically and those are surgical procedures where tissue is removed so that inherent with that is more risk including the risk of scar tissue and incontinence but also more recovery. So post-treatment expectations, as I, as I alluded to earlier, this has been a revolutionary simply because the treatment improvement, uh, Im sorry, symptom improvement may start within a few days to a week or two. I've often had men call me within a day or two of the procedure and state that their flow is already significantly improved. 
Although symptom improvement starts within a week or two, you may continue to see improvements for up to three months. So if you had the procedure and you see some improvements at two weeks or four weeks, but not all of your symptoms are better, you know, rest assured that there's still opportunity for those symptoms to continue to improve. And the reason for that is uh, most symptoms are related both to the prostate and the bladder. So when we open up the passageway and we open up the prostate, some symptoms like the flow and the emptying get better rather quickly, but some other symptoms like frequency and urgency, which are predominantly symptoms related to the bladder, take longer to get better. Most common side effects are mild, and as I mentioned, will typically get better within a few days to a week or two, and they can include uh, some burning, a little bit of blood in the urine, some mild pelvic pain, some urgency with a sudden strong need to urinate, and the inability to control the urge, which is typically temporary. Again, as I said, these symptoms are mild to moderate in severity, and often within a week or two will dissipate. And the key component of this is how long does this treatment work and how long is it good for? And the durability is proven out to five years. So we have excellent multiple studies now that look at the durability of this therapy and they're effective for several years. So another question, which is an important question, uh, particularly for all of us is, what is, what about insurance coverage? You know, this sounds great, uh, but you know, is it covered with my insurance? Almost all insurances recognize and cover the Urolift treatment simply because they recognize that this is, uh, by its nature, being less invasive and less need for hospitalization, uh, overall a less cost compared to some of the traditional surgeries. So it's recognized and reimbursed by Medicare nationally. There is, of course, always copays and deductibles that you may be responsible for, but it is a covered procedure. Most, if not all, non-Medicare plans will provide coverage for the Eurolift system. At Chesapeake, we have a group of uh, our staff that works exclusively in determining your insurance coverage. There is no hidden cost to you. If you choose to, to, to proceed with this procedure, all of these points will be discussed with you and you'll be given those costs up front. And uh, you know, those are very carefully uh, vetted by our staff. Uh, more insurance coverage also is available on the Eurolift.com website. But as I said, in the states of Maryland, in Maryland particularly in the D.C. area, uh, this is uh, definitely covered, and almost all insurance carriers recognize and cover this procedure. So, uh, you know, what next in terms of, you know, if you're interested in some of these therapies, uh, we do say, you know, as I said, reach out to your urologist if you're seeing someone with Chesapeake. Many of our physicians are experts in providing these procedures. Many of them have achieved the, the center of excellent designation, which is uh, after have, going through a rigorous training program with the system. Uh, and all of them will be able to guide you. This is not necessarily the right treatment for every patient. So as I said at the outset, this is not a one-size-fit-all therapy. So if you have symptoms that are bothersome to you or you've been on medical therapy and your symptoms are progressing, uh, then certainly I would say pick up your phone, reach out to Chesapeake Urology. As I said, we have invested significantly in our telehealth uh, systems. So you can actually reach out to your doctor via telehealth at the convenience of your home, which at the time of this pandemic is, is important for all of us uh, and provide for your safety. So you can reach out and we will further tell you about the options and have that discussion. Now, as I said, if you, if you are choosing to have a procedure, it may entail some more tests that are required, that do require an office visit, but the, the initial consultation certainly can be done uh, via a telehealth visit. So we are here, again, like I said, the key part with all of this and the key takeaway with this new therapy is that this is a significant improvement in your quality of life. And our goal at Chesapeake is to provide men with the cutting edge therapy that allows them to have an improvement in their quality of life and recognizes the need to have men who have symptom free without the need for being tied down to taking medications on a long term basis. So with that, I'm going to stop uh, our slide presentation and I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I believe there are some questions that have come through and I'm going to take some time and go over some questions. And if you have any questions, please, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, to pass those along in the chat. But I think we already have some questions here, so I'm going to address some of those. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Kalsik, and thank you to everyone who submitted questions before the webinar. 
We did receive a very large number of questions, and we've consolidated and summarized them, and Dr. Kausik will now provide us with some of these answers. However, again, if you have other questions that you've thought of during the presentation, please feel free to make a telehealth appointment with a Chesapeake Urology physician. Just go to chesapeakeurology.com and click on telehealth appointments. So our first question, Dr. Kausik, is if I'm doing fine on my medications, should I still consider having a urolift procedure? That's, that's an excellent question. And I think that uh, it's a question that we hear oftentimes uh, in our practices. I'm taking a medication like Flomax or Rapaflow, and my symptoms seem to be controlled. Why would I consider any other form of therapy? Uh, and the answer to that is we recognize that medications can improve symptoms. However, most of the medications that are used for an enlarged prostate do not address the underlying enlargement of the prostate. And as a result, uh, even though you may have an improvement in your symptoms on medical therapy, this may not change the impact that it has on your bladder health long term. And oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, medications come with side effects. And, and the more medicines you take, the more pronounced those side effects can be and the interactions can be. So it is not uncommon for us to hear about men who are on medications like Flomax to experience dizziness, uh, to experience sort of a general lack of energy, of headaches, fatigue, and also the sexual side effects. Uh, so traditionally, the only option that we had in lieu of medical therapy was surgery, which was the TERP, which had to be done in a hospital setting and which required a lengthy recovery. So it made sense for men to say, let me start on medical therapy, and unless I really see that medication is not working, I'm going to hold off on surgery because that seemed like a big step to take. With the advent of these newer therapies and with them being office-based and with them being uh, quick recovery and durable and catheter-free, it seems to be that more and more men are choosing to have a more durable, permanent fix for their symptoms rather than staying on medications long term. So the answer to that question is, while for an individual patient it's perfectly acceptable if they are happy on taking medications for them to continue with it, more and more men are seeking out these newer therapies simply because they don't want to be tied down taking a medication which carries other side effects for the rest of their life. Okay, thank you. Our next question is this. What if I have another condition, for example, kidney stones or prostate cancer, or for example, if I'm being treated for prostate cancer with active surveillance, am I still a candidate for Urolift? So another good question, and I would say the best answer to that is it depends on your specific condition and what the treatments you're undergoing are. Uh, as I said at the outset, you know, multiple different conditions can happen in the prostate. You can get an enlargement of the prostate. You can also get a tumor of the prostate, which is, you know, diagnosed as prostate cancer. Uh, and these can happen concurrently. So there are men who have a large prostate but also have a tumor in their prostate. So the answer is for men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer uh, and who have bothersome urinary symptoms, the Urolift is still an acceptable form of therapy. And as a matter of fact, if you are choosing, for example, to embark on radiation treatment for treatment of your prostate cancer, it is actually helpful in many settings to treat the troublesome urinary symptoms before you start radiation so that your recovery during the radiation and after the radiation therapy uh, can be improved. So having another condition like prostate cancer uh, or having had a history of kidney stones uh, or even having had a history of bladder uh, tumors that have been resected does not by itself exclude the possibility of treatment for an enlarged prostate. But again, you know, it depends on your specific scenario and what treatments are planned. For example, if you have prostate cancer and you're planning to have your prostate removed, of course, certainly there's no role for the Urolift implant or any other procedures for an enlarged prostate because the prostate is being removed. So uh, it's difficult to address every potential combination here, but having one condition does not rule out or exclude the possibility of having a treatment for an enlarged prostate. Okay, our next question. What would happen if the prostate continues to enlarge after the Urolift procedure? Ah, great question. So any procedure that we do for an enlarged prostate, 
even the traditional TERP procedure, which is a question I get asked a lot of. The first thing they ask is, is this permanent? And the answer to that is always, we expect it to be, but there's a caveat. The prostate can continue to grow. So even in the traditional surgical procedures where we go in and remove the tissue that's obstructing, the channel can start to grow back over and can cause obstruction again down the road. So similarly, with the Urolift implant, even though we spread open the passageway and place these permanent implants there, that does not necessarily mean the prostate cannot grow again. And if it does grow and start to become obstructive again, then this procedure does not burn any bridges to having any other therapy down the road. So what I mean by that is if you have the Urolift system and say four or five years down the road, you start to have regrowth of the prostate and that you know, down the road causes some troubles with urination, this procedure can be repeated. Uh, or you can choose to have you know, the more traditional procedures down the road if you, if you want to. Or if there's a newer therapy that we don't know about, you know, five, six years from now uh, that is, is available, uh, we don't see that the Urolift would prevent any new therapy or an existing therapy from happening down the road. So the answer to that question is if the prostate does grow, it can be repeated or another form of therapy can be considered at that time. Thank you. And can you remove the implant if needed? Right. So again, as we talked about, there's a lot of, you know, patients, some patients have concerns about any placement of implants. So as I said at the, uh, at the outset, these are very, very small, tiny implants, uh, stainless steel. One question I get asked a lot about, I don't know if it's on the list of questions, Pat, but I'll address it while we're talking about this, is am I allowed to have an MRI if I have this, uh, of the Urolift? And the answer is yes. These are tiny implants. They will not in interfere with the conventional MRI. Uh, can an implant be removed? And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, if the implant is found to be uh, inappropriately placed, meaning it's too close to the bladder, it develops a calcification, which is very uncommon, uh, those can be removed. Uh, if you need to have another form of prostate procedure uh, where we go, have to go in and shave the tissue, if the, the urolift system, say a couple of years down the road, it didn't, it didn't provide you with the type of relief you were hoping for, uh, and you're in the minority of patients who needs another form of therapy, then the implants can be removed. Uh, it is very uncommon to have to remove an implant, and I've been doing this now for several years and have placed almost, I've treated almost 500 men with the urolift system, uh, and I would say that I've had one or two patients in that group of men where I've had to remove an implant. And those were men when I was early on in my training with this procedure where they, I perhaps placed the implant a little closer to the bladder than I expected. But it's highly uncommon to have to remove the impl an implant. Uh, but if it needs to be removed, it can be done so s quite easily and with minimal risk. And how would I know if I'm a good candidate for Urolift? So again, you know, uh, Urolift is FDA approved and it is FDA approved for men over the age of 45 who are suffering from an enlarged prostate. Uh, and it is approved only up to a certain size of the prostate. So uh, we didn't really get into the specifics of the, all of this, but uh, men who have a prostate under 100 grams uh, are good candidates for the Urolift uh, based on the prostate size. So. The first thing that would need to be done if you're considering this is to get an estimate of your prostate size. Uh, as I mentioned before, exclude other conditions and then potentially have some more tests like the cystoscopy and the flow test to de determine the level of obstruction that you're, de you're experiencing. And then based on those initial tests, your urologist will sit down with you and talk about the different treatment options. And one among those options will be the Urolift. As I said, in my experience, this has you know, revolutionize the way we treat men with an enlarged prostate because it is by far the quickest and the simplest and the easiest to recover from. But that doesn't mean that it is necessarily the right treatment for every patient. So that determination is done with a discussion with your urologist and also some of the anatomical considerations based on the prostate size and the shape. Okay, great. Thank you. And what makes Urolift so unique? So, you know, I've gone over, I, I think that you know, if you had asked me five years ago whether a procedure would have come along where we can place implants in the prostate to open up uh, an enlarged prostate, I would have really been quite dubious of that. Uh, and there are very few things that come in urology that sort of really change the landscape of how we manage a condition. 
Uh, and we have been doing the Turk procedure uh, for nearly 50 plus years to manage men with an enlarged prostate. And it is, although that procedure has improved considerably over the years, it is still a surgical procedure and carries the risks of surgery uh, that men have been traditionally reluctant to consider. So until now, we've really had no good viable option for men besides either medical therapy or surgery until the Urolift procedure because this has really allowed men to have a minimally invasive procedure in an office setting with a quick recovery, with good durability, with no sexual side effects, uh, and with a fast recovery that allows them to get back to normal quality of life. These are the things that I would say make the Urolift a unique system and make it really a, a revolutionary therapy for men suffering from BPH. And another question, does installing Urolift have any possibility of severing nerves resulting in incontinence and or impotence? And does the procedure cause reverse ejaculations? Yeah, so excellent question. Uh, again, as we talked about, traditional surgical procedures, because you're cutting and removing tissue, can create scarring, can change the, the passageway for the flow of semen. So traditionally, surgical procedures like the TERP or the laser TERP do result in reverse or retrograde ejaculation. Uh, the Urolift is the only FDA therapy that has 0% risk of erectile dysfunction and 0% risk of ejaculatory dysfunction. So uh, the answer to that is there are no sexual side effects as a result of the therapy. At any procedure in the initial phase can cause some issues with bladder irritation like we talked about in terms of that urgency and that lead, sudden need to go, but there is no real risk of permanent incontinence related to the Urolift because there is no removal of tissue and so as a result of that, no damage to the sphincter muscle uh, that can result from that. Okay, and two more questions. The next one, what are the restrictions on activities after the Urolift procedure has been performed? Um, so, as I said, traditionally this can be done in the office setting under local. It can also be done under sedation if you feel that's more comfortable for you. These are done in our ambulatory surgery centers. So, uh, again, another reason you know, for, for all of us who are potentially avoiding or have concerns about hospital settings in this, uh, in this current pandemic, uh, this allows men to proceed with their therapy in an office-based or a surgery center-based uh, treatment, so it's done as an outpatient. Uh, you don't have to be in the hospital. Uh, usually a catheter is not placed after the procedure. However, in some men, a catheter may be required overnight. Uh, traditionally, the recovery is a few days of burning and some blood in the urine, uh, a few days to a week or two of some mild pelvic pain, but a rapid return of activity typically within a week or so after the procedure. Okay, Dr. Kalsik, other than your, are there other physicians in your practice that do Urolift? Absolutely. So as I said at the outset, you know, uh, we have several well-trained urologists in our practice, many of whom have uh, achieved the rare center of excellent distinction. Even for many of those who have not had that distinction, they have had a wealth of experience in managing men with an enlarged prostate and treating them with Urolift. So Chesapeake Urology physicians have often been at the forefront of cutting edge technology uh, and implementing it in our practice, whether it's been, you, you know, we were the first, uh, we, the, one of our surgeons was the first to do robotic surgery in the state of Maryland. Uh, we have been at the forefront of many cutting edge therapies. Uh, we've had the first robot patient, uh, physician who did a robotic bladder removal in Maryland. So uh, we have several physicians who are at the forefront of leading us in cutting edge technology. So again, many of us offer these treatments and other treatments for an enlarged prostate in our office setting. So the first thing I'd say is reach out to your urologist and go over these treatment options with them. And if you have any specific questions about this, this uh, the Urolift, you can address that with, the, with your urologist. But the answer to that question, Pat, is absolutely uh, most of our practice is involved in doing these procedures. Okay, thank you. And we did have one more question that just came in. Can you perform Urolift on a middle lobe? Okay, so another good question. Um, this is a more sort of uh, alluding to a specific anatomical variant with an enlarged prostate. Uh, you know, I, don't, I didn't kind of go over that, but 
There are some men where, you know, rather than having the traditional sides of the prostate closing in, they have what we call the floor of the prostate rising up, and that's called a middle lobe or a median lobe. And uh, the Urolift system is approved to treat that, and in some men, uh, you know, in some men it may not be the right option, but for the vast majority of men who have a median lobe, it is absolutely an appropriate way of treating them. As a matter of fact, there have been studies that have looked at men who've had the middle lobe treated, and they've actually done better traditionally than some of the men who've had the more traditional side of the prostate enlargement. So the answer to that question is yes, but there are nuances with that therapy, and it's not, ne not necessarily the right treatment for all men with the median lobe. Okay, that concludes our question and answer session, and I'm gonna let Dr. Kalsik make a few closing remarks. So in closing, again, I would like all of you, to, uh, you know, for us to thank all of you for attending this and uh, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about one of the newer cutting edge therapies that we have to offer at Chesapeake Urology. Uh, I know this is a difficult time for many of us and our families. Uh, you know, please reach out to us and ask us how we can help you in any way in regards to treatment of your urologic health. We're available, you know, either via telehealth, we are seeing patients in our office, we are also starting a resumption of elective surgeries based on uh, Governor Hogan's uh, recommendations yesterday. So uh, please reach out to us and we will be able to direct you from there. But thank you again for attending and I uh, hope you uh, found something informative from this uh, seminar.